performance, and that has consequences. Looking at the Denver target um, adjustment, it's not the same for all building types. And this is because in the analysis for the implementation plan, we found that not all building types are in the same place in terms of progress toward Denver's ultimate goal. Some building types are closer, some are farther away, just because the code has really focused more on some building types with its requirements than others. So these different DTAs are meant to begin to bring all of those building types toward the ultimate goal, recognizing that it's going to have to happen at different rates for different building types since some are behind. Did want to address after those two kind of big points. Um, there are a couple of uh, specific kind of technical details, and one of them is, you know, since we're talking about total building energy and not just regulated loads, uh, that then becomes, if we're doing a reduction of the total building loads, um, the impact of process loads or other process load like loads, I think we might call them, becomes a real concern. You know, these are you know, either whether it's in manufacturing or in healthcare. And so we have built into this a way to kind of segregate the process loads from the calculations so that you're not trying to find a way to reduce your total energy to account for loads that can be substantial and that you really, really have no control over. So that's the broad picture of what the first of the two proposals do. I want to now show you the second of the two hey, Sean, proposals. Can you, could you fly your cursor over the spot uh, where the language does what you just said, where if you don't have control over a load, you're exempted from that? Energy use from process loads submetered in a since IECC requires submetering can be excluded from the calculation. Thank you. The other proposal is meant to do two additional things. It adds a site energy metric to the modeling path. So this is not instead of energy cost, but in addition to energy cost. And the intention on this is one to foster electrification because there are a couple of features in Appendix G, just the way that it's constructed that um, can discourage electrification because of the realities of energy cost. So moving to site energy can begin to neutralize some of them. It's not perfect, but it does go a long way. And so this proposal just adds site energy as a metric, and it includes the language that we need to do that. And one of the important bits that it does include is, well, I can't highlight just a um, column, so it creates a specific site energy BPF. These were created by Pacific National Pacific Northwest National Labs. They're the ones who calculate all of this stuff for Appendix G. So they created some site energy specific BPFs for Denver uh, to be leveraged. And the rest of the language really just tells you how to use Appendix G when you're using site energy instead of energy cost. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of word replacement type of things instead you know when appendix g talks about energy cost well we're actually talking about site energy we have the same dtas so that same thing uh, that same adjustment is in place in this proposal you'll just see that the energy cost bpf is there because we're adding this site link site energy language to the proposal that you just saw they could conceivably just be one proposal but uh, they were split into two so that these two things could be uh, discussed independently. Uh, so that's the broad overview of the proposals themselves. Katrina, would you like to um, take a pause for questions or should we dive right into why they're structured this way? Well, let's pause for questions and then I think it would be great if you can go through some of that why, because that was some of the question from the committee. Sean, I, I was just a little confused on the first one with the plug load thing. Can you can you review that? Is that saying you can completely exclude all plug loads in like a corn shell office where you don't have control of them? Sorry, I just didn't. Not plug loads, but process loads. And and the code has a definition for process loads that probably nothing in an office would qualify for. 
so is that so what is the intent of that like pools and and things like that no it's more like manufacturing and then um it we did because of the discussion with the committee decided that in healthcare and hospitals that plug loads there should be considered like a process load just because of the nature of those specific plug loads they are both quite substantial and you know are are related to health and the health of patients so we really can't do much about those so yeah that's that second sentence it just it just basically deems plug loads and healthcare to be process loads, even though they wouldn't normally be carried um, as part of that. Definition. So when you say healthcare, does that also include medical office buildings? That is one of the things to discuss. Healthcare is a term that's used throughout the code, but isn't strictly defined. Um, so I think that that is one of the things that, uh, particularly with the building department, would need to be worked out is of course. drawing that line, because some people would consider a medical office and some people wouldn't. Okay. All right, um, well, is there... Oh. Sean, uh, real quick, I was hoping you could um, screen share the impact on our uh, tracking chart for both yes. these tools. Thank you. So the site energy really doesn't have a impact of its own because what it does is creates flexibility. But if we look at the impact of calibrating Appendix G, um, I'm gonna try to put my cursor right over this. So if we add the calibration of the code, we can see what this chart does, and some of you aren't familiar, is it tracks the impact and the status of the various code vintages relative to the implementation plan goals in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So we can see that uh, while in terms of pure energy, the Denver Energy Code from 2019 uh, may not have been on a progress chart like this, normally may have fallen behind. In terms of greenhouse gases, it was doing all right. Um, there are two dots here for 2022. One is the maximum potential of all of the proposals that have been put forward as part of the process. This includes the electrification proposals, uh, these stringency changes, renewable energy, and then all the smaller proposals. Where the dot is right now, that represents how close we get to the line with just the stringency change that is partially reflected in this modeling proposal um, alone. So if we go down and we turn it off, you can see that it goes quite a bit higher. Um, the, the committee has already adopted a few proposals that improve from the 2021, which is the, the base code from which Denver is starting. Um, but you can see that this stringency uh, par portion of these modeling proposals really do represent a significant amount of moving toward Denver's goals. So are there any other questions? And of course, we'll want questions and discussions as we go along. So I think probably one, one of the big- question. Yes. Um, so about the, uh, when we're moving to um, site energy, instead of energy cost, you said it didn't, it didn't replace it. So are both metrics used? You have to meet both? No, you don't have to meet both. You can meet either. So it's a it's a flexibility provision. It it provides an additional metric that you can choose, and all electric projects would be you know motivated to choose it instead of energy cost. Um, we're not Thank quite you. to the point of replacing energy cost at this point, but we do want to provide that flexibility. All right, so. Probably one of the really big questions is why do this? Um, as Katrina said, there are we have these goals coming out of Denver's implementation plan for meeting these long-term goals, and we need to make progress toward them in each code cycle. 
one of the big weaknesses in the underlying code that Denver uses, the IECC, is section C407 is widely considered in the code development world to be profoundly flawed. Um, <clears throat> and this comes for a couple of reasons. The biggest one is really that it has not received any substantial methodological update since 2009. Um, and it has not received any update in the code since 2012. And that's when this 0.85 factor was added. So what we've seen is a divergence between C407 and the prescriptive path in the IECC. Uh, C407 picks up improvements to the envelope, improvements to me mechanical equipment um, efficiencies, and improvements to LPDs, but basically has not picked up any other code advancement that has been made in the prescriptive path since 2009. That 0.85 factor was added in 2012 to try to calibrate the two together, particularly the impact of Section C406, which was added in 2012. Um, according to most you know, best estimates, we'll just say, by uh, people who are involved with this, you know, particularly staff from PNNL, is that to recalibrate C407 to the prescriptive path in 2018, um, that factor would have needed to be moved to 0.7 at the absolute highest, probably lower than that. And now we're talking 2021, so that's broadened more. Appendix G, on the other hand, has gotten continuous maintenance in that exact in that time to address new technologies, to make sure that it is able to pick up these other kinds of requirements that are beginning to be added to energy codes. And then there are kind of the issues that arise with having multiple modeling paths for code enforcement. When we look around the country at the other jurisdictions who are kind of the advanced jurisdictions who are doing the sorts of things that Denver is doing, pretty much all of them have uh, replaced C407. So Seattle and Washington State, New York State, I believe Massachusetts, Boulder, they've all recognized C407 as being a fairly significant weak point in being able to advance their energy code. Um, and that's the the reality. So for, for both the inherent weaknesses of C407 and then the issues around implementation, the moving to just Appendix G as the approach. Um, and then the other, I think, big question is, uh, why not just move straight to targets? And that's absolutely the direction to go. We helped Boulder develop their target approach. Uh, so, you know, we're pretty familiar with it. Uh, if we look, there are two jurisdictions that really have a target based approach that's Seattle and Boulder. And both of them, I think, recognize some of the inherent issues that we have moving to a target approach right now. Our modeling protocols aren't really set up for targets. Um, to be able to do that, you would have to regulate a lot of the variables that are currently right now just neutralized with the reference model. So, you know, if you change your schedule, well, you change it in both the reference model and in the and in your proposed, and so that neutralizes it. If you just have a target, that allows all of those variables to be used, you know, to eventually essentially change the outcome of the building model. Boulder has leveraged ComNet to help to fill that gap, and that actually goes a long way. However, ComNet hasn't been updated since 2016. It's no longer being updated. And if you look at it, it is fundamentally an asset-focused approach. So um, say you look at the set point schedule in ComNet, a lot of buildings have 24-hour set points, even though they're you know, real buildings in Denver that are going to have to comply with the EUI uh, targets of Energize Denver aren't going to have 24 hour set set points. Um, and it doesn't cover all of the variables that are important. It doesn't cover occupancy density, doesn't do anything with ventilation, which is actually an increasingly big issue. So while it goes a long way, it doesn't kind of control all of those things. And then if you look at Boulder and Seattle, both of them use an approval based approach. So it's not an as of right compliance path that's available to any project that wants to use it. It's the code official has to approve it because they both recognize that 
these projects are going to need a high level of scrutiny to ensure that what is being modeled is actually reflecting the actual building performance, what they can really expect, and that no one's trying, you know, no one's making mistakes and no one's trying to game the system. And Boulder has the additional um, insurance of it, it uses prescriptive ASHRAE 90.1 as a backstop. So in their target based approach, you know, you would be limited on your window to wall ratio. You would have to meet ASHRAE 90.1 prescriptively and then go on. So because they're going so far beyond ASHRAE, they've got this cushion for them. What is at stake is only the difference between their code and ASHRAE base code prescriptive, not anything more than that. And Seattle is perhaps it's one of, if not the most sophisticated um, building department in the country when it comes to enforcing energy codes. So they're comfortable making those determinations. In the end, both of them end up operating like a formalized alternate means and materials approach. So technically you could do target based approach right now if you can get the code official to approve it. Um, but that's a big if. But in those two jurisdictions, you would have to get your approval to use targets anyway. So there is still that if. We really do need to get that direction, and that's why these proposals have things like disclosing the PEUI so that we can begin to see those and catalog those and think of, think about our designs in that way. Um, but last year with discussions with the city internally felt it just weren't quite there to use it in a city like Denver. Boulder is fairly low, um, low levels of production and low somewhat of a low rise um, city. So it's really a different setting than what we're seeing in in Denver. Hopefully we can get there, but we just feel like we're not quite there yet. And so do we have any questions on that? Sean, I, I was just gonna add, it is codified in Boulder's uh, approach that you can use Appendix G or the site UI. You don't have to get any formal approval before doing the EUI. So just a clarification there, it's they don't require that um, that you get approval before using the EUI method. It, it is built in C4, their C407, um, just to clarify. I'll, I'll take another look at it, but I'm fairly certain the language says where approved. Sean, we've, thank you we've for never going had... through some of your reasoning on some of this. Sorry, Elizabeth, I see you were wanting to chime in. I was also oh. going to just ask, go go ahead, and then I wanted to ask Group 14 to chime in because I know they had submitted the PEUI proposal. So I'd like to sort of just as like sort of opening, make sure we're giving some of that reasoning for why they did want to move to that proposal. But go ahead with wherever you wanted to chime in first, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to echo Taylor's comments. That I don't think there's anything that says it that we have to get pre-approval to use EUI and we do it all the time in Boulder. Great, that's that's helpful just to know that that's already familiar kind of in our local market. Um, Taylor, I don't know if you might be willing to give a little overview of what you all were thinking with submitting that PEUI proposal. Yeah, um, yeah, and so I, two, either, yeah. Yeah, I can I can go for it here and, and yeah, just to clarify from, my understanding of reading it right now, it allows you to use that without pre-approval. You do have to be, they only give six building types, right? So it's a pretty limited scope of building type um, with the UI. But yeah, the, sorry, to take a step back, the reason that was brought up is just with a lot of people on this call, there was conversations about the moving only to Appendix G um, and some issues with that, which I do think the site energy addresses. But on the other side of the coin is now everyone in our community that never understood what an EUI is, is now asking us constantly about what the predicted EUI of their building is, how it lines up with Energize Denver, and why they can meet the energy code and not have an EUI that's under Energize Denver. So there's a lot of questions like that going around. So, and I know the city was looking at EUIs at some point. I, I agree with a lot of what Sean was saying. But um, we still think it's we're at a really unique time where every developer is asking questions about EUI, and it just makes sense 
to have a code that would have an option for an EUI because of that. So that's kind of how it came about is just really because of this great movement that Energize Denver has started within the development community to be paying attention to these things and and developers understanding that, you know, a, a fine could be a very serious hindrance to selling a building, right? If, if there would be a potential future fine. So the developers are taking it very, very seriously. I think the other thing is trying to explain the ASHRAE methodology, which is definitely robust, but is incredibly confusing with all the calculations now, right? Like, whereas it was just get to this percent savings. So, right, we're so used to saying get to 24%. That's what you have to do to meet code. This Appendix G is a lot more confusing, not that it's not robust or makes sense, right? But developers don't understand that where they do understand an EUI, you know, you have to hit 44 for Energize Denver. I didn't put in any, any EUIs in my proposal. I think that's a whole different conversation, um, but it would be, you know, below that, obviously, um, and and they get that. So, so again, it's just a, an understanding thing. Um, I also think in our proposal, we kind of went the other way uh, with all of this. There's a, I didn't want to get into the weeds of trying to say this is how you should model. And like at uh, Boulder has their methodology, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with that as Sean referenced, and that's just uh, comnet schedules. I actually don't necessarily agree with that approach. I think it's hard for the city. I agree with that. To, you know, we don't want to game the system. But I think Energize Denver is that backstop, right? Like if if you completely make something up to get a building to pass, but then that building's not going to meet Energize Denver, that's a major risk for the developer. So I don't see a lot of developers pushing for that or or really anyone. Um, so I think, you know, at some point we've got to make that leap and we've got to trust people and people have to start modeling for outcome instead of modeling for a comparative baseline. Um, final thing is I still think this is much more robust, but technically I could see a situation where you could follow Appendix G, do a full gas baseline, meet code, and not have a predicted EUI that's below 44 for a multifamily or 48 for an office or whatever, but if it is a very a gas intensive building. Um, so that's kind of all that. I think too, that this is energized Denver has basically made us step up as modelers and be responsible and, and for what we're delivering because we have a lot of clients coming back to us already saying, how come this building you modeled three years ago is over the target? And and so we, I, I think as modelers are going to be um, putting the best work possible on the, you know, delivered at permit. Because if if I'm predicting low and, and buildings aren't meeting it, we're gonna we're gonna lose clients. I I think that it's both a risk for the developer and it's a risk for the modeling businesses because they're they're gonna have to, yeah, just be a lot more um, responsible for what they're putting out. And I just double checked, it is, so Boulder's final version doesn't require approval for just target-based, it is now only approved for um, the outcome-based. So I had to double check on that. My memory of a few years ago wasn't, wasn't correct. So thanks for, for catching that. Okay, thank you all for that initial framing. We have, you know, 22 minutes left. I'm hearing, let's see if I get this right, sort of three big categories of conversation that we need to have. One is around Appendix D. And first, do we like the modifications that are being proposed around some of the treatment of process loads, the Denver target adjustments, the a site EUI option, and there's probably more that we should flesh out together. The second is 
around PEUI. And if we were going to consider that, I think we need to get this group's input on like what needs to be developed further to um, have a robust proposal for how that would work in code. And then third is a question of like, sort of, do we want to keep C407 or not? Does that sound like the right three buckets? Because I wonder if we can just list like what needs to be covered by this group within those buckets um, so that we can kind of resolve each of them over our next three meetings. Yeah, I'll, I'll add just one more thought to that, and that's, you know, with the old C407 and it's arbitrary 15% or 24%. Um, and I know we had this discussion in the last code cycle as well about, you know, whether C407 was not as aggressive as the prescriptive code. And um, Sean, it sounds like you're saying that it is it is less onerous than, you know, following C406. And I think all the modelers here would strongly disagree with that. Anytime we do performance compliance, we have to get a better building than a project that uh, follows the prescriptive code. So not that I'm necessarily advocating for C407 methodology, but that I would say for every building I've ever modeled that that's, that's not, uh, not necessarily true. So for, no, I, I, I can't speak to your experience. That is, an, on average. Um, so like I said, I was I was re reporting what the discussions at the, the national development has been about overall stringency, just due to the number of prescriptive requirements from the from IECC that you don't have to comply with on in the C407. So that may be one of the issues is, and I think that modeler quality becomes a pretty substantial issue um, because I've, I think some people don't realize some of the things that don't have to be complied with um, out of the prescriptive path, you know, particularly around infiltration. Uh, wait, that one may have changed. So, you know, this is this is what we're seeing in the national discussion. There have been a few attempts now to get rid of C407 from IECC. They have not quite succeeded yet. Uh, but it is every code cycle, it becomes a pretty substantial uh, discussion point about what to do about C407 and the fact that it's lagging behind. Yeah, I mean, I, I disagree with that when we had the same conversation three years ago, and I still disagree with it. You know, if it's a prescriptive requirement, it's a baseline. And if I have a deficit relative to a prescriptive requirement, I got to make it up somewhere. So just because it doesn't mean it's a mandatory requirement doesn't mean that those savings aren't still happening. And just logically, like, you know, if we look at straight 2018 IECC without Denver modifications, you know, I could meet all the prescriptive requirements and just get 10% lighting savings and be done. If I do the same building under C407, I have to, you know, achieve all the savings that from the prescriptive requirements. And now I have to achieve 15% overall energy cost savings relative to that prescriptive baseline. I mean, 10% lighting savings versus 15% total savings. I mean, I just don't see how logically you could see that the C406 building is better than the performance building with everything else equivalent. Like I, I the, math, the math just doesn't work. So well, I mean, that, not that I'm advocating for this, but C407 is not the devil. Um, and people are used to it and it makes sense. And, you know, it's it's fuel based where, you know, the fuel of the baseline follows the fuel source of the design. So it's not necessarily cost based. So again, I'm not necessarily advocating for it, but I just want to say it's not it's not horrible. <laughs> and And I think that that's the case is that it's not... 10% lighting savings over prescriptive versus 15% total building savings. It's the baseline in C407 is not prescriptive. It's something less than prescriptive because it doesn't capture all the requirements that are in the prescriptive path. And that's why that 0.15 existed in the first place. And that was actually seen as not being aggressive enough in 2012. Um, and the rest of the code has continued to advance since then. Some things getting captured into C407 by reference, some things not. Uh, I think the things that we are hearing from projects in Denver, that they are doing above code projects using C407 and cannot meet EUI targets that were 
pulled from buildings that were mostly built to prescriptive standards. Um, I think that that is a, a strong argument and that that is what is actually happening in Denver. But I would say the prescriptive one wouldn't have met the EUI either. I mean, it's pulled, but right then you have a building with like a pool that they're running like crazy and all these things, right? That the prescriptive isn't necessarily looking at or a bunch of outside air, right? I think there's a lot, but not to run down this rabbit hole too far. I think in general, what a lot of people were talking about when we talked about only going ASHRAE and part of that reason the EUI path came up is like, there's just... I get it's hard from the code side, but from in the last meeting too, we had the the conversations that more options keep people happier because they're like, okay, maybe it's harder, but I have more flexibility. So removing all the options, I think in a way, like we're going to push back a little bit, right? Because it's like, well, why, why do you just take away all the options? We only have one now. Why can't we have another one? Um, so I think that's kind of one mindset. Right. That's like, OK, well, if we lose C407, do we get the EUI then? <laughs> so we have another pathway. Um, so. OK. Um, I don't want to go too far down the C407 rabbit hole, but I think that's really helpful framing for the discussion we need to have on sort of like, do we keep uh, that one? I think that you just nail hit the nail on the head with like the fundamental question of like, is do we achieve our goal of making sure new buildings actually perform at the levels? Uh, required under energized Denver and on a path to net zero energy. If we keep, if we going to give more options, um, or like, can can we get there if we have that all the paths um, available? Um, but maybe we circle back to sort of which paths we keep after we've. Because I haven't heard proposed changes to C four hundred seven, um, and so maybe we circle back to that towards the end of our discussions is what I might propose and. Um, focus more on the modifications that are proposed to Appendix G and refining those because I heard that a lot of folks like the kind of some of the changes that Sean is proposing, um, like adding in site uh, and some questions about some other things. And so my sense is the group needs to work through the details of modifications to Appendix G and the group. I, I, I'm hearing from the model there's a lot of interest in refining this PEUI proposal because the conversation has shifted to PEUI because of Energized Denver in your conversations and work with developers. Um, but I think I heard that from Elizabeth in group 14. Can I just vet with um, others like Linda and Mohit? Like, is that also true for you all? Because that, um, like, are you, uh, you know, are you yes, seeing absolutely. a shift to a conversation around PEUI? Would it be useful to have that be a code compliance pathway? Is that sort of a need that you are feeling that you have? Absolutely. I think that um, consulting around the EUI puts it in terms that, that a building owner will run their building to and have access directly to as data. So I think absolutely. Okay. Um, that is really helpful. Um, Chuck, if I might call on you, because I'm hearing that from energy modelers, but I know um, then CPD would have to regulate and review PEUI models, and that would be new. And so I don't know if you can speak a little bit, um, and I'm sure the modelers could help us also, but could you speak to some of what your, cons like what concerns do you have about you know, the group 14 proposal or like what Boulder has in place that we need to address if that's going to really be a viable option to have on the table um, this code cycle. Before I start, I'm going to yield to Mohit. I think he was about to say something when. Sure, sorry. No problem. I didn't see him. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like the EUI, PEUI thing, but I think we need to be a little bit more um, open and um, clear about how those targets are right. You know, I, I think Taylor started that conversation and he said that that's a totally different um, animal we need to address at some point. Uh, if you do go down the PUI path, then everybody needs to be comfortable how those were arrived at in the first place. And I don't think that's clear yet. And uh, that, that's a big problem. If you do go down the EUI path. I had one more in the um, in talking about the buckets of of where we would focus our energy and bandwidth. I'm just going to put this out there. 
Um, it picks up on some of the work that um, Jamie and the ME engineer team has done. But really, ultimately, what we're trying to do is reduce carbon. And so something that is a framework that looks at the time value of carbon is even more important than an EUI. Uh, so in 2030, when a, the grid is 80% renewable, we're still looking at carbon. Now that might be beyond the scope of um, this code cycle, but I wanted to get it out there um, because I really do think that that is a helpful, um, a helpful goal. Yeah, Linda, I think that's a great point. I mean, I even see Energize Denver having to go that direction just because this time value of carbon is so, so key to how we yeah. operate buildings. And, and and it's not so much getting to zero energy as it is to really reducing our carbon. Yeah, thank you both. That's exactly right. It was not part of Energize Denver because a lot of buildings don't even have smart meters to know when they're using energy <laughs> yet. Uh, so it just was so far off from the feasible, but um, it's something we should all keep our eye on because of course, as we get to a more renewable grid, the time when energy is used becomes that much more critical. It just isn't regulatorily implementable yet. Can if yeah, if I could just have you record in your in your minutes there that we're all in. I think we could take a vote to see if the all is applies, but I think just we're interested in getting there. So it's technically challenging, but um, of interest. Yep. Noted. Chuck, so, do you want to? Yeah, that question to you. <laughs> So yeah, the, to, to answer Katrina's original question, like the building department currently doesn't review PEUI. I mean, obviously PEUI is not a um, something that's a compliance path. And the predictive modeling that's required to develop PEUIs is a lot more specific and intense than comparative modeling. And so it, it would definitely take a lift of setting the guardrails around like the requirements of um, how the models are required to be created in, in Denver. I know Boulder has used ComNet, so we do, we would need to find something similar to be able to help um, set the guardrails of what the requirements are to be expected to be submitted and then for the review teams on, on how to review it because currently we don't have um, energy modelers on staff. We have architectural engineer or architects, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, and electrical engineers who would be reviewing these. And so um, there's definitely going to be a definite big learning curve with that. And then when talking about the EUI targets, I think it would be critical to um, defining those is important, but then defining those across all the building types in Denver and the different occupancy types in Denver because um, some of these proposals have limited occupancy types and limited building types, and I, I, we would need to make sure that we we hit the broad range to make sure that we are equitably uh, requiring EUI targets to be met. And then, uh, then it also leads to the discussion of um, perform or outcome based um, designs. And so, I, and I think so. I think the PUI is a good idea because it leads to that outcome based. Um, Compliance, um, just it, it seems like a large lift right now. Chuck, I think that I think that could probably be mitigated pretty easily um, from a, a modeling standpoint. Um, all the same inputs have to happen. You know, we have to choose efficiencies, we have to choose schedules, we have to you know build the build the envelope. There there'd have to be some discussion about what rules. Uh, need to, need to be applied there. You know what are what are the schedules uh, that should be used in the models to to target these fixed EUIs? Um, there's obviously some <laughs> different schools of thought there. Like, should we use actual schedules that we expect for the buildings, um, or do we need to use these uh, standardized schedules because we're going for standardized EUIs? 
Um, the latter obviously makes for more consistent modeling, but also means that the results might not be true to life. So there's a you know philosophical question. Uh, but from a review standpoint, um, I think uh, Chuck, you guys would be able to um, trust trust the professionalism and you know whether you require a stamp or a certification, just like you do for a, a designer of record. If a, it's an architect or a you know MEP folks, uh, I think it's fair to require that there is some type of qualification for modelers. Um, but but otherwise, I mean, all all this, the inputs are, but are the same, you know, the, the schedules, the efficiencies, everything else. I don't think that it would necessarily increase your review time um, uh, or the reporting. And I think a solution too could be like Boulder and even maybe go further is like really narrow the building type, right? So, so you could really only do like multifamily and office, maybe hotel, even multifamily and office, that's gonna cover a huge amount of the construction in Denver but really be narrowed and and appendix and that's really what Boulder does too, right? Appendix G is the catch-all. It has every it can be used for every single building type, no matter what. Whereas this is really kind of a more focused approach, and that's similar um, to to try to alleviate that. I also think to try to alleviate trying to come up with procedures, right? It might be easier if we really narrow what that would be allowed for. I th I think that. Some of the comments that we've heard really emphasize two things that in in a PUI approach, you you need to either regulate the models or regulate the modelers. Um, you know, if if you if you can trust the professionalism of your modelers, then you know going through the models with a fine tooth comb to make sure there aren't mistakes or games um, becomes less important. And, you know, I think that we have. It, my impression is that we probably have some of the best modelers in, <laughs> who serve Denver on this call right now. Um, but as modeling becomes more widespread, that increases the demand and that creates an incentive for other people to to step into the market. So, you know, from the from the city's standpoint of ensuring that their code is actually being enforced, they would need to look at one of those or a combination of those two of regulating the models or regulating the modelers. Um, I, I think that I've I've laid out the challenges with a PEUI approach, but um, we still don't think that those challenges are insurmountable. They're just challenges that need to be addressed before it gets adopted and in the way that it's adopted. Thank you all. I think that frames the questions around PEUI really well. And I am starting to see some of the of work we need to do or side conversations we might need to have on a few things to figure out. You know, I'm hearing from the group, I think it's worth taking a stab to see if we can put together a robust proposal for PEUI. Um, and then we'll have to see, like, does this feel like we're there? To your point, Chuck, because this is a lot to develop in not a lot of time, but I'm hearing that the group would like to try. So this is really helpful. Um, on Appendix G, can we spend just the last three minutes uh, listing out what issues need to be further developed and thought through? I heard, I think that the group likes adding in the site EUI column, or um, is there, is there work to be done on that or is, you know, does that looking pretty good? Uh, and uh, you just, you like that um, similar, like there were questions on process load from the committee and its treatment and on the Denver target adjustments, like what outstanding questions do you have? Not around if it becomes the only path, but around the modifications that are included uh, so far. What, what do we need to work on? Sean, I had a quick question that I think I know, but this gets rid of the minimum amount of PV, right, that you could account for. ASHRAE does not have that, though the IECC did. You're muted, Sean. We went back and forth on that with the city, so I would need to look at it again to see where we landed, but I believe that it does. Have a minimum or does not have a minimum? It, it gets, either it raises the minimum or it gets rid of it, but like I said, we went back and forth and I don't remember where we landed. 
And and the only reason I bring that up is just with, you know, there's definitely ways to get their efficiency, but you know, people are always playing what's lowest cost. And when you're taking 50% away of the 75% and then some more percent, there's not much left. So some people might want to do, you know, a simpler HVAC system with more PV. So I think allowing them that flexibility would be important with the ASHRAE path. And I definitely think the site changes everything, right? I don't think we could do it without the site because then everyone would have to do gas basically. <laughs> um, so uh, that's a huge part of it. So one of my questions is, is so if there's an exception, that exception in there for process loads, is that exception mirrored in the energized Denver requirements? Because I would assume that if we're allowing that use of energy to be exempted out of the co-compliance that it, the energized Denver would also have to align to that. Um, yeah, yep, if there's, and we should look at the definitions and make sure they align. So um, I'll take that offline with Sean, but the energized Denver has exemptions for manufacturing and agricultural buildings with a significant process load where they'll have their own compliance uh, pathway, so. And then the, Site EU, the site BPF was calculated by PNNL for Denver specific mm -hmm. or the energy cost budget building performance factor was pulled straight from ASHRAE. And so those, those pulled straight from ASHRAE. PNNL actually ran some Denver specific uh, energy cost BPFs for us, and they were more stringent <laughs> than than the basic ones for the, the climate zone that Denver zone that Denver is in. So in discussions with the city, the decision was made that since we're already pushing in a lot of ways on this to just kind of let go on that one. So are the, do these two BPFs for site and cost, are they, is there parity between the two? There is probably not specific parity. Um, the, the site then might be a little, well, no, because the, there should be, they are fundamentally different metrics. So um, energy cost is really going to be in a lot of ways dominated by utility costs. And and those were the things that um, led to Denver's BPFs being more stringent. Denver specific was because of the difference of energy costs rather than clim climactic differences. So since they're driven mostly by you know, once we're looking at only climactic differences, they are should be much closer. Uh, we can ask PNNL how much closer. Um, uh, the reality is that because the, the site energy approach probably it does more it incentivizes electri incentivizes electrification quite a bit um, because the gas baseline that's in Appendix G is still there. <laughs> So it's still a gas baseline, but you're going on on site energy. So that was also one of the conscious decisions is that just by moving to site and not creating a site energy um, baseline system parity, which you know PNNL thinks you should because that's the most technically accurate way to do it, um, you end up, you end up incentivizing electrification even more. Great. I know lots of you need to jump, so I want to let folks do that. Feel free if you have other thoughts on Appendix G. I'm happy to stay on for a couple minutes. I think the team can, but um, if you have things you want to share that you think we need to work on regarding Appendix G, but we can let people jump and you can always send us an email on that um, and we'll take all of this in. And I think we'll have sort of a meeting on PEUI after we work on a bunch of things. Uh, at a meeting on Appendix G after we work on a bunch of things. And then I hope in our last meeting we can circle around on sort of like, okay, what is the right combination of paths? How does it fit with the GBO? Uh, things like that. Sound good? Katrina, can okay. you share notes that were taken down for this just so we know the big talking points? And so I don't think others were taking notes. So we have yep. it all in like tracking it. We will make sure those are sent out. Tom's been taking detailed notes. I've got my notes sort of arranging some of those next agenda points and we have, we'll put those together and get them out shortly and we'll make sure. Yeah, thank you all. And again, thank happy you. to stay and chat if folks want to just, <laughs> if, especially as because we kind of rushed some of the Appendix G, like what else we need to work on questions, um, but. Thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you. you all for your time. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.
So I had a couple other thoughts on Appendix G that. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Tuck. <laughs> well, just um, with the Denver target value being applied to regulated, unregulated loads and regulated loads, how does that apply across high energy use buildings? Like with, you know, does that create parity or equity issues between different occupancy types and groups of, of buildings? And I just, that's just an overall question that I've, I've had since the beginning is, is if you have a low energy building that Denver target um, gets applied to the um, unregulated loads and there's very little that needs to be made up in the regulated loads, where if you have a high unregulated load building that Denver target gets applied there and you have to make up for that unregulated load um, in the regulated loads. So if you have like a restaurant where it's, you know, a large amount of cooking, a large amount of energy being used, the, of the unregulated loads, now it needs to be made up in the regulated load. So I just, that's a concern I have. And then also the the metering or the sub metering of the process loads. Does that apply to gas loads and electric? Because the the code section reference is only for electric metering currently. I th I think to that that question about for the high energy, what that ends up doing is one of the realities of the determination studies for Appendix G. So you know, calculating what these what the code delivers in various building types is that it assumes fairly high process loads, even in high process load buildings. It, it's, it's assumptions about unregulated loads are kind of high, um, and, and that's probably going to have a cascading effect through the codes. I, I think that this is one of the challenges of applying the DTA to the, the whole building, and you know, just kind of one of the consequences of doing so. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit unpredictable. And um, I think that's one of the reasons having the flexibility of still being able to go prescriptive, which a lot of high process load buildings do anyway. Um, and then also having site available, I think that that helps in other ways. But yeah, that is going to be one of the challenges of applying the DTA to whole building um, across the board. Uh, and and I and I understand the challenges because I mean obviously Energized Denver looks at the EUI of the building and doesn't really care whether or not it's regulated or unregulated loads. It looks at the load on the building. Um, but I know like ASHRAE 90.1 Appendix G compliance for PCI, the BPF only gets applied to um, the regulated loads. Mm -hmm. and, that, and so. I, that's my only concern is about the DTA being applied to non-regulated loads and then having to make up that difference in the regulated loads because you're required to model unregulated loads the same in both the model and the, the, the baseline and the, the predicted model. And so, yeah. Outside of, so there's, I mean, there's manufacturing, restaurants, Restaurant loads can fall under the category of process loads by the definition in the code. Um, then there's healthcare, which some of the loads already qualify as process loads, and we've categorized some of the others as process loads. Um, so I think that by using that process load exemption, most buildings, from in terms of trying to get the energy from their regulated loads, it shouldn't be too bad <laughs> you know it's it, it shouldn't be worse for them than it is for anybody else i guess is probably the better way to put it. it it might still be bad for them because it is it is a big jump in stringency and then if we compare um what the determination studies you know say is delivered in these building types versus energized denver because i think that's the second part of your question is by excluding these process loads are we setting them up for failure under an energized denver and what we see when we compare the determination study EUIs versus Energize Denver is that for those high process load buildings, um, the actual buildings are performing far better than, um, than what we're seeing out of the determination study. Um, so, you know, the, 
the over assumption about process loads, I think, gets kind of accounted for just in the fact that the the EUIs that Denver is using are from actual buildings and actual process loads versus, um, you know, just estimated large process loads. We did, I think I showed this, I may not have. So we did a quick comparison and this is quick. So I want to be clear that it's very quick <coughs> of the determination studies energized Denver for various building types and how they compare. And, you know, what we see is that, um, you know, we have some of these high price, high process load um, occupancies like this, but that's because the, de the determination studies are assuming larger process loads than what you see in reality. Most of the places that we're, we're seeing actual issues are just with tall buildings because of the way that the determination study, they, they look at tall, you know, tall buildings are more energy intensive and in some ways less efficient. <laughs> and I think the energy, the energized Denver is, you know, it's pulled from the actual building stock. Um, so when we look at the comparisons, you know, most of, for the most part, even older versions of the code are delivering buildings that should comply with Energized Denver, especially when you consider that the determination studies have large process load assumptions and um, high occupancy assumptions. So most of them should be fine. It's just these couple of, you know, key outliers that might need some extra attention. Yeah. Well, and I, I'd just be would it, I'd be very interested to hear because I know in Boulder they use Appendix G, and just I know Elizabeth yesterday Ted, there was a we were talking about a IECC proposal for the um, well uh, allowing PV to make up some of the the difference, and she said in Boulder it's required because of the unregulated loads is part of the appendix G. So, I, and, I, and I'm not an expert on it, so I would love to hear their opinion, but I know Elizabeth and the modelers had concerns in the original discussions in the IECC code committee regarding the, uh, the unregulated loads as part of appendix G and the DTA being applied to them. So I, I would, I'd love to hear their, their, their thoughts and concerns regarding that topic specifically. I, I think that for them, some of the things that are driving their concerns are risk and then just the ability to do, you know, to do so, you know, to to actually make up for some of those unregulated loads, you know, particularly with some of the assumptions. Um, you know, one of the things about Appendix G is that, you know, things like plug loads, you're not told what to put in. You just put the same thing in your base model as in your proposed so you know you can you can mess with your regulated loads to a certain extent this is you know, it's the reality of modeling is that it's just not perfect i think that i think that for really for denver the fundamental question with the peui is going to be are you ready to enforce this you know are you able to go through models to make sure that no one is gaming the system because group 14 you know, is, is probably not going to game the system. You know, they might occasionally make mistakes and you need to review for that, but they're not going to game the system. Um, but once you create a market demand, other modelers will step in who are willing to game the system. And the risk to developers is not as great as you might think because the develop and hold developers are a minority. Right. Develop and sell developers who can just sell that liability to someone else without them realizing it, that's the majority. So, you know, a lot of developers are going to be fine hiring someone that kicks the, the problem down the road. So Energized Denver is not a backstop for modeling by any stretch of the imagination. I do think well, though, what, oh Chuck, I'd love to hear your take on, because what I, I've heard from Group 14 and others, I think today um, and elsewhere is that there's some, that we can define metrics 
that need to be reported and to make sure it's realistic. So there could be metrics around what the assumptions need to be for plug loads, for lighting loads, for schedules. Boulder has an example of how to do that. Um, and I'm sorry, you were about to say something, Chuck, but I'm just wondering, no. like, it seems like these are the solvable problems what I hear from the modelers. Is it feeling solvable to you? And like, what do we need to answer to solve it? Well, I, I think it, it it would take a modeler and an expert in modeling to be able to define the the guardrails um, around it and the expertise around that. And I guess what I'm saying is CPD currently does not have that expertise to define the guardrails. We could probably be trained to look at, at the models, but the problem is, is like even today with C407, performance model gets submitted, we receive a summary of what they claim to have input into the model. And if you ask for the actual modeling report, it's a 500 page document. And, you know, there's, it would take uh, someone very knowledgeable to be able to dive in there and go through that. And so, right. And you I'm need like a simple report template uh, for the what you need to review around the, what the assumptions were. Um, I think Group 14 is willing to continue working on their proposal and draft that sort of report template for protocols for their models. Um, we can follow up offline. And, and you got and you the you know there is the liability. Like, what is is the city of Denver liable at all if we're approving a PEUI for a building for co-compliance and then they fall on their face when it comes to actual outcomes and energize Denver? I mean, to me, that's- I don't think I don't think so because half of building up performance is operations. So I can't imagine under any world where um, you or CPD, frankly, or the modeler would be uh, liable. Then they need to do their best work and you will need to do your best work. But at the end of the day, um, the way the building is operated is going to make all the difference. And so um, yeah. I, I just, well, and to speak to Sean's point earlier when he brought up either you regulate the modelers or you re regulate the models. I mean, Denver, we require sign and seal drawings, prof yeah. design professionals on drawings, and then we review them. So if 